Constructed Criticism is sponsored by Oasis Games. MTGOasis.com is the place to get cards for your next Magic event. Try them out with code CCMTG for 15% off of your first order, and use the code Would That Be Good for 4% off of every order. Want to support the show directly? Head on over to patreon.com slash ccmtg to check out some awesome benefits and future goals for the show. Thanks for listening, and here's this week's episode of Constructed Criticism. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Constructed Criticism. I'm your host, Spencer, and I am joined by my co-hosts, Trey McLarnon. This is the sound of my voice. And Mason Clark. Ho, Gak, ho, Gak, my one true love. Episode for you. Oh, wait, me and Hogak can be friends forever, though. Yeah. Fun fact about the ban list I had a hot take in my tweet before the show, if you did not see it. But I fully believe that green red is actually the biggest gainer in this uh, this standard unbanning. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And like that deck wanted right? nothing more than a, uh, than, you know, a hasty undercross, or not hasty, an evasive undercrossed creature. So. That also is suddenly good against a bad matchup. Like, that's kind of weird. That makes sense. Yeah. Then bad matchups left the format, too. A lot happened for it. No, I... No, what are, you, what are we talking about? I'm talking about... I'm, I'm talking about... Oh, format. I thought you were talking about Scape Shift. No, I'm not talking about Scape Shift. I'm talking about Standard, baby. Oh, Isn't talking, talking about, about Standard talking about Scape Shift? <laughs> Man, this is weird. It's like when I, I the mention where scape- there's two Scape Shift decks. Uh, yeah. Oh wow! What a life to live. What a life! What a life to live. Yeah, I actually think that Gruel Aggro in Standard was the biggest get from the unbanning. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I think that makes sense. Kind of like the Gruel Aggro deck, like the Crab Man deck. So instead of playing Chain Whirler, you don't have to have crazy mana. Yeah. I mean, I already had stopped playing Chain Whirler and just like playing more Domeries and stuff. And like this just makes it so you can play one less Domery. Uh, and actually have a good main deck 3-drop that's evasive, which is something that your deck already wants. Uh, and now that I think that people have figured out that uh, Domery's Ambush is actually the best 2-mana removal spell, and it's not close in that deck due to its synergy with uh, the Crab Man himself. Like, the the deck is, I think, really well positioned to like have a decent scape shift matchup now. And, you know, uh, hopefully you can just play those Cinder Vines for the Nexus decks, and suddenly you have good matchups against the big decks as the mid-range deck, and that's just kind of where you want to be. Boom. That, that was a that was an intense intro, fam. That was a, <laughs> a intense freaking intro. But that's what this podcast is about. It's about learning, talking about new stuff. So should we get into uh, hashtag always improving, Trey? Probably, yeah. <laughs> well, hashtag always improving is the point of the show. We want to be getting better all the time. We want to talk about things that are going to make us better. And we hope that you'll get better along with us. So this week, Trey, why don't you lead us off? What did you do this week to get better at Magic the Gathering? Um, my always improving moment was something that kept up coming up recurringly during the main event uh, in Las Vegas, not only in my matches, but when I was talking to other people. And that was Chalice of the Void Triggers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, my opponents missed yeah. them. I know that. Yeah, that's the thing. And so the thing that I think that I wanted to talk about is not only just being sure that if you're playing Chalice in your deck, that you have to be vigilant of the fact that that's going on and that those triggers are there. And that if you were playing against Chalice of the Void, you should be Chalice checking your opponents because they are going to let spells resolve. Um, I, I had a matchup where I was playing against a Chalice deck and I cast four one drop spells into Chalice and he countered three of them and not the fourth one, <laughs> even in the same game. Um, and it was a faithless looting that resolved, which ended up being pretty key to me winning the match. And so it's just a thing that just because that's happening, you know, if you don't have an effective way to remove the chalice, or even if you do sometimes possibly that you're digging to it, there can be a lot of value to be gained still to just chalice check your opponent because it is a easy trigger to miss. And it's something that happens consistently over and over again. And it has a big swing in the game. If your opponent casts a spell that costs two mana and comes into play and doesn't do anything because they don't remember the trigger, then that's a pretty big tempo loss. My opponent did it with costing four because I cast a chalice for for one into a chalice for two that resolved. So, you know, the real blowouts. (laughs) Boom. That's the stack for (laughs) you. No, I completely agree. I also watched uh, Mason's opponent let him resolve a brainstorm in the Legacy MCQ. And I think it's something that... You know, I, I think a lot of players right now play most of their magic online. 
And so these things are typically remember, remembered for them. And so now that we have Arena and we have MTGO, and basically so much of Magic at this point at a competitive, from a competitive standpoint, it's played from online, we should really kind of just talk about, you know, getting the reps in for that you need for paper so that you don't, this stuff doesn't happen to you as much. Because, it, I mean, if we're honest, like, when po paper was the main way to play things, and I would play in PTQs, people were way better at remembering their triggers, and I feel like it actually has taken a decline since the online presence really happened. Yeah, I think yeah, that's especially true. true of Legacy, where, like, you're going to play 99% of your game's Legacy online. It's just yeah. so hard to play them in paper, play them in person. And I had lots of opponents play Chalice of the Void this weekend, and I had a lot in the Legacy event I played, and a lot of spells resolved. So, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And one of the key things, too, as a reminder, it's going to be less important now considering the banning, but just because you flashback a spell, if the flashback cost is more than one, that doesn't change the converted mana cost. Absolutely right. Yeah. And it is a weird thing, too, right? Because, like, when you think about it, you're like, oh, that spell costs them three, but it doesn't cost three. I, I, that, that really tripped me up for a long time when I was it, first trying to play. It's, it's funny because uh, Trey trey told me like was like was telling the story to me and like I, like i knew exactly what happened when he told me i was like yeah this is definitely what's about to happen <laughs> like his opponent definitely is gonna let this resolve yeah uh, it, it's a thing like it's, a, it's an easy one to miss up it's an easy one to miss and so that's the reason that i wanted to bring it up because it's something that i think comes up a lot because it's just continually see chalice triggers being missed all the time what about you mason what did you do this week to improve at magic the gathering well, mine actually kind of played into the chalice thing that we talked about, which was uh, slowing down again. It's uh, kind of a problem I have where, like, I'll rush through things at times, especially if I know that, like, air quote, no, I have the win, if that makes sense, right? And it's pretty easy when you do that kind of stuff to almost cost yourself or to cost yourself games. So just making sure that, like, I slowed down, uh, especially in the Legacy MCQ and the early turns of Hogak. Um, and then the final turns of Hogak and made sure that I was like taking my time. Like, I think it was you came up or maybe it was Kling, but like I had the win and I got kind of like, I knew I had the win. I started to go through things. I'm like, wait, I'm about to mess this up. I yeah, had to I was, like, I was watching myself. Yeah. yeah, it was the legend rule Hogak, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, I had to legend rule my own Hogak. And I almost messed that up because I was going so quickly. And that would have cost me the match. So just little things like that. I'm trying to slow down and, you know, take my time with that stuff. And especially with Legacy, once again, you know, like don't want to miss Delver triggers. Don't want to, you know, think like oh yeah you always grab fire island in this spot with your run and six you know sometimes you just want to actually grab a fetch land in case you're trying to draw their brainstorm or just things like that slowing down and making sure i'm taking my time with my spells and making sure they resolve the right way makes a lot of sense yeah what about you spencer uh i have three uh so Oof. kind of a crazy uh i kind of go through them in like the fastest order possible so uh i'm quitting paper magic for the most part um it's something that uh, I'll, I'll play in MCQs when they're drivable, uh, but I'll just kind of just be an MTGO and uh, and arena grinder from now on. And I don't know if I'll grind Mythic on Arena. I still might not actually have time for that because of some things that are going on, and I'll, I'll announce some of that uh, here in a little bit. But yeah, I, I just I think that right now, like my relationship with work and my relationship with uh, magic and my relationship with the podcast just kind of decades that I need to reevaluate kind of what I'm doing and Wednesdays was supposed to be like this day where I like go to this local tournament and uh, at our awesome sponsors of Oasis Games ad coming soon but uh, the thing is is like I can just get so many more matches at home and I can do other things uh, in that time and uh, I've been playing more magic due to using Streamlink to play magic on my phone when I go to bed, and it's just increased the amount of magic that I've gotten to play by a pretty substantial margin, uh, just kind of due to the fact that I have a hard time falling asleep, so I'm just able to get a lot of magic matches in. And then once it comes to Mac, baby, game over. Uh, so yeah, so kind of quitting paper magic, which I think sometimes uh, as uh, our responsibility as competitive magic players is kind of to self-assess and see where we're at, and then just be honest about that. Uh I'll still obviously play MCQs and 1Ks when they're applicable, but you know I'll be mostly be in the uh, the challenges and on arena from now on. Nope, that's awesome. Are you uh, excited by that? Like, is that something that's exciting to you, or is that like a yeah. a thing that you feel like you, you know what I mean? You just hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So actually, this GP, which is the second always improving moment, is really the reason for doing this. 
because going into this Grand Prix, I wanted to make sure that I didn't make the same mistake at the last Grand Prix that I went to, where I played a deck that I knew wasn't the best deck going into the weekend at GP Denver. I, I thought that Teamer was fine. I still think it's a... It, with, before Skip Shift, I thought it was a playable standard deck. Uh, I, I said on the podcast with Caroline that... And I even tweeted, like, before the Grand Prix, I, I was like, just talk to Caroline. I already know she has the sweetest deck in the room. Uh, it, but, like, before round one of the Grand Prix started, and uh, I had seen Andre's deck list because he had obviously tweeted it, and I just knew going into this that, like... I didn't want to do that, so I was going to play Legacy at the GP instead because I was like, I don't have time to play Standard. Uh, and then Matt was texting me about the Charge Tron deck. Uh, I got to play, get, well, watch him through some stuff, talk to him about the deck, talk to other people of the deck, and just kind of knew, like, this is something that on paper was something similar to what I wanted to do at the Grand Prix. Uh, I actually got Empty Joe Traders to actually play Tron and Eldrazi Tron and try those decks out. I knew that I liked Eldrazi Tron for the format, but I was like, well, uh, I still don't think that I have enough time for this Grand Prix, so it's kind of whatever. Um, and then when I saw that deck list, I was like, well, this is just, like, the good version of Eldrazi Tron. Uh, if we're being honest, like, I get to cut my Eldrazi, and I just am a way better overall deck. Uh, and then I actually got to play against Togak with the deck, and knew instantaneously. I was like, oh, this actually uh, has probably above an 80% win percentage against Togak in game one, and just actually annihilates the deck. Because you actually don't sideboard that much, and they don't really have a good game plan for you, because uh, we did not know this going to the Grand Prix, so it's even better. But Force of Vigor cannot uh, actually break up your combo. So that's, yeah. a, that's a separate hashtag always improving moment that Matt and I... I got one for Kling. Yeah, Kling, don't put your chalice on four, friend, to stop Force of Vigor. Hey, You're lying. It actually it. got the concession, so it might have been just correct, <laughs> because, like... That like if his opponent like he could have just told his opponent, hey, this doesn't stop it, but he didn't remember. But to be fair, yeah. if his opponent's like, well, I don't, I don't care, like I'm still not conceding, just putting yeah. it on four to get the concession is also fine, I guess. I, I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So to to be fair for anyone who's listening who's not following what's going on is that uh, Mycosynth Lattice makes all the cards in your opponent's deck colorless, so they cannot exile a green card to cast Force of Vigor for the alternate cost, yeah. or they do not have one. Yeah. Thank you, Trey. Uh, but yeah. So so. But the, what I really learned from this Grand Prix is, like, I actually was really able to uh, pick a deck that, uh, even though Matt and I both didn't day two, we both very easily could have. Uh, and I played against Hogak zero times and played against Ponza. So, you know, my tournament was just ready to go. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think that that's one of the things that also that I don't love about Modern. Like, uh, uh, the best deck by a substantial margin is only 20% of the field, which I just don't think would happen in Standard. So. Yeah. Just like, you know, in standards from like 25 to 35 percent of the field. And like, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but like that extra five to 10 is like massive when I mean, you think about almost, it. That would have been 15 percent at this Grand Prix. So, you know, yeah. it, it's just it's just one of the things tough. But in doing this Grand Prix and in playing modern again, I realized that like I really actually enjoy one of the puzzles that modern presents. And I really missed playing Legacy uh, when I thought about playing that Legacy uh, MCQ, I was like, oh, this is actually something that I really missed and really enjoy. And so kind of it all added up to, I want to know Modern better. I want to know Legacy better. I want to be able to talk about it really well on the podcast. I want I want to continue to play Standard because I just love playing Arena. Uh, and so that they kind of just added the GP where I like didn't, I made a lot of mistakes because I didn't know my deck. And I didn't know my deck because I don't play a lot of Modern right now. Uh, and I think that I'm pretty easily able to, to remedy that. And I'm pretty excited about it. That's dope. What's number three? Uh, yeah, and then uh, number three, I don't remember what it was. I might have been. It actually might have been the uh, the force of vigor thing. If I'm being honest. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. <laughs> That's an always improving moment. Macros and Lineup also let your lands tap for a man of any color. Yeah. Don't yeah, even do so that. It actually would have come up because we had spell skites in our sideboard, but. Yeah. Cool, but yeah, that is it for me. Uh, but GP Vegas was actually really fun for me. I don't know about you guys. I had s multiple people come up to me, uh, and that's always just a great feeling at a Grand Prix. So thank you, everybody, who did. Uh, I am uh, walking around and, like, kind of in my own zone sometimes. So if I was kind of shaken by you saying hello to me, I'm totally sorry. Uh, but I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Yeah, it's always cool when that kind of stuff happens, you know? You run into someone who, like, likes the content or recognizes you or, like, you played that, like, a weird thing that happened to me was, like, uh, in the legacy MCQ, people were like telling each other their moto names. It's like, oh, you're, you know, JIT user 93, you know, we played last week, you crushed me, you know, it's like yeah. this cool, like, whenever you, even if it's not content creation, just people, you know, it's an awesome feeling. 
and Vegas is like the spot where it happens the most, in my opinion. I, I liked watching uh, all the people that would come up and meet Mason and then be like, Mason, esports. <laughs> <laughs> I did happen a couple times. Someone's like, are you that esports guy from Twitter? I'm like, That's great. That's yeah. great. Well, uh, you know, what else was awesome was being our patrons. No Patreon question this week. We'll have a new thread up here after this podcast. So if you are a patron of $5 or more, you get access to the Constructed Critics group where you too can ask a question in that Facebook group. Uh, I have to send out a, a Patreon invite to that group. So if you are the new patron, uh, I apologize that I didn't get it out to you. But we'll make sure to get that out to you uh, so that you can be a part of this next uh, thread of questions. But before we do that, if you aren't a patron yet... Uh, I announced it a while back, and we've been trying to figure out how we want to do it. But Matt Kling and I are actually uh, ready to bring back Constructed Clash. It probably won't happen this week, but it will happen here in the next couple weeks. So uh, the way that it will work this time is I will actually be streaming my side uh, with kind of uh, on a delay, you know, uh, where the, the, the chat can obviously be involved, but I won't be taking stuff from the chat because I'll just be trying to uh, stream that. The VOD will go up on YouTube, and then Matt's side will go up on Patreon, in addition to a post-game talk where we will talk about the plays and, and talk about the matchup that we played on Constructed Clash, and that will actually be available to CCMTG patrons. So it's kind of just this extra thing that Matt and I were going to do anyway, and we, we just kind of get to give that benefit to the patrons, uh, and that will be all patrons. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of you, and I'm excited to do that with Matt every week again. Yeah, it's cool. Contractor Clash is a fun thing, so it's good to see it back. Yeah. Well, uh, you know what else is fun is our sponsor over at Oasis Games. Trey, why don't you tell us about them? Hello, fellow Magic competitor. Our reading for today comes in verse form. Oh, Hogak, my Hogak, our fearful trip is done. Your feet have crushed every rack and many prizes won. The end is here, death knells ring clear, the people all exulting, while follow eyes the steady keel, your hordes so grim and daring. But oh heart, 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 oh the bleeding drops of red, where in the heap my Hogak lies, fallen cold and dead. Oh Hogak, my Hogak, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up for you the flag is flung, for you the militia bugle trills. For your bouquets and ribboned wreaths, for your shores are crowding. For you they call the zombie mass, their eager faces turning. Hear Hogak, dear father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the heap you've fallen cold and dead. Oh, Hogak, my Hogak, your work has was not a crime. You trampled your enemies completely. Your time was brief to shine. And instead of cheers, you're met with sneers, but your legacy just beginning. Faithless looting, your bosom friend, goes with you to your resting. Exalt your mob and ring your bells, but I will hang my head. Walk the ground, my Hogak lies, fallen cold and dead. And if you're like me, and I think you are, then you're grieving right now in your own way and you are forced now to explore new depths and modern, but you are not alone. Head on over to the good folks at Oasis Games, and they'll help you find your new modern home. Use code CCMTG for 15% off your first order, and you can use code Would That Be Good for 4% off every order. All right, so here's the deal. That was the best ad read ever, and uh, <laughs> just ad hoc. We're going to have a special version of that ad read available. We'll have Trey record it separately. And we will post it for people to download. And with, if you download it and you make a video with an Oasis Games ad video, with that, uh, you get $100 to Oasis Games if we pick it. Uh, that will be paid for by the podcast. So uh, we'll, we'll get that created. That contest will go live uh, as soon as Trey gets me that audio clip. And, yeah, let's let's see those Oasis Games ad videos. <laughs> huh. Hey. <laughs> so... Just to clarify, since this literally no one knew the ad except for Trey beforehand, and this is happening <laughs> on air, and this isn't like a planned thing, I just want to clarify for the listeners who might be confused. Let's say I'm a listener who yeah. heard this ad. I go to the Constructed Criticism of Twitter. I download the audio file. Then I make a music video. With I mean, you, the make, yeah, you make a video with the audio. Yeah. And okay, you, okay. I'll, so I'll, it's like a – yeah. Okay, sorry. You make an mm. Oasis Games ad video. It doesn't even have to be that. It can be something meanier. If you don't want it to be an ad and you just want to, you know, pay tribute to the Lord and Savior Hogak, that's fine too. Uh, we'll put an Oasis Games logo at the end and uh, yeah. 
this reminds <laughs> me of like a Super Bowl commercial where like it doesn't quite make sense. And at the end, the Wixis Games pops up and you're like, oh, Doritos, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> if you want to do a Doritos commercial off of this, Mason just gave you that idea. But if, if if we pick it, <laughs> if we pick it, a hundred dollars to Wixis Games, we'll get that created uh, for everybody. But you know what I just thought of from that ad, uh, by the way, Trey? Walt Whitman? Well, no, that Militia Bugler grabs Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah. Well, it also wears swords pretty well. It has vigilance. Yeah, what is happening? This is like the way better version of Callblade, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to pump the brakes on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, know what, you know what my always improving moment was actually in the last 24 hours? If I put Stoneforge Mystic in any deck, I get to call it X-Blade. So I have Amulet Blade, Soul Blade, Harden Blade. I have a lot of Blade decks. I'm a big fan. I'm really excited you know, Blade to is my favorite. I'm really excited to beat Infect Blade, man. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, backup plan, Noble Hire, put this sword on. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I had sold my batter skull by the way. I found it right before we went live, so I'm really happy about the blade thing. So Oh man, I have so many batter skulls. <laughs> Dang it. Hey, can we just can I get some credit for how close I was on like what I wanted to what actually happened? <laughs> you fuck you uh you nailed it. I didn't almost cut I definitely got a super wrong too. <laughs> so props to you slops to me. <laughs> yeah. It was really funny because Ben Williams, one of our patrons, was like yeah, they're not going to unban multiple cards in Modern at once. I was like, yeah, I'm totally fine with what happened. Like, this, yeah. is, this is more than I would want. I mean, it's not because, like, I tweeted exactly what I would want, but it was pretty close. Yeah, I mean, like, you tweeted, like, three cards, right? Like, that's pretty crazy unless, like, something drastic was happening. So it's like, you know, that's a good hit rate. For me, what I remember happening is I'm about to fall asleep. I make a tweet. Then the next thing I know, I wake up. I go to the bathroom. I get out of the bathroom. And someone says, Stoneforge Mystic Glen banned the Airbnb. And I'm like, well... I got this super wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, and then I looked at my phone and had 374 notifications. <laughs> Very soon after that's what happened. <laughs> Very soon after that. Well, you know what we're about to notify people of this week, Trey, is we're going to talk about the legacy power rankings. Man, we have not done this, I think, at all since you guys have been on the show. So I'm excited for the new listeners to kind of hear the you know a power rankings episode on, on this, this very fun and exciting format and uh yeah kind of bring people what's going on so we have our normal point scale something that we were considering changing in fact if you want us to change the point scale we'll just let people decide tweet at us uh we are considering changing it from the current scale into kind of just total match points so we just give you total match points uh and and rack them up and then post them it'll it'll be more interesting for formats like this where we're taking five o's or where we're not taking five o's or things like that we're taking uh you know the challenges and the the uh, classics and things like that. So, you know, it'll actually weight decks a little bit differently according to event, which could be something that you care about. So if that's something that you like, you know, let us know. We we're happy to do it. But let's start with our honorable mentions. We have Mono Red Prison and Sneak and Show coming with 17 and 18 points. Sneak and Show, uh, Trey, a deck that you're a fan of, uh, that you actually played at this MCQ, coming in uh, kind of as the honorable mention with those points. Uh, why don't you just give people a quick synopsis and then we'll move on to Mono Red Prison. Yeah, I mean, I I think the deck's great. I mean, you know, generally, it's when you talk about a synopsis as far as like what the deck does generally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the, the deck you you cast the card show and tell, and you put in a unbeatable monster, and you win the game, <laughs> and or you put in the card sneak attack, uh, which sneak attack is a an enchantment that's a one red activation, and you attack with either Immerkel or Grizzlebrand, and then you uh you know which or whatever one it is, you draw a bunch of cards, or you blow up all of your opponent's permanents. Um, the deck also runs some number of omniscience generally, um, so that you also have the, the additional like guess factor that your opponent has to do when you cast the spell, like they could have containment priest or some other kind of hate card you put in omniscience and then just cast all of your things, or they have Caracas and you just cast Emrakul, they bounce it. It doesn't matter. There are a lot of different scenarios like that that come up, but it creates a weird, uh, cat and mouse game where, uh, you know, the card show and tell is both people get to put something into play, but the stuff that you have to put into play is much bigger and better than what they have to do. So, uh, Trey, why don't you, that was a great explanation, by the way, why don't you actually tell people about your really interesting situation that, uh, that came up on, on your judge call? Because I actually thought that that was something that listeners could learn from as far as how that interaction works. Oh, yeah. So in, in the, uh, the last round I was playing against taxes 
and I cast a show and tell, and my opponent had two white mana up, and I anticipated that they probably had a card containment priest, but I was in a state in the game where I didn't really have any options. I just added a, I, I couldn't beat the card uh, in the situation that I had, and so I just had to act like it didn't exist. Um, for those of you that don't know, Containment Priest is one white colorless. It's a 2-2 two -two with flash, and if it's on the battlefield, then any cards that would enter the battlefield, any creature cards that would enter the battlefield that without being cast are exiled. Um, so it's a hard counter to sneak attack. It's a hard counter to show and tell. Uh, my opponent was unsure as to how the card worked um, entirely, and so he had called a judge in order to clarify, uh, and basically the distinction is, is that if you put Containment Priest into play off of Show and Tell, it will not exile the creature that I've put into play off of Show and Tell if I put in a creature because they enter the battlefield at the same time. Um, but instead, if you flash it in while Show and Tell is on the stack, then I can't effectively put anything into play. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's something that I think that uh, your opponent uh, could have benefited from knowing, and I, I hope our listeners uh, learn something there. Yeah, and it's something that I've certainly seen people do wrong. I mean, uh, for those of you that don't know, I like I have played a large amount of show and tell um, for for many years, and it's something where certainly someone has just put containment priest into play off show and tell and been like, "Got you," and I'm like, nah, "Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way." Absolutely. Well, let's talk about mono red prison really quick, Mason. If it's okay, I would like to take the lead on this one. I know you have something to say, but I think this is one of the decks that if if it had made the the top eight power rankings that we would talk about a lot more. But honestly, I think this is a deck that I'm uh, highly looking at in Legacy right now. It's a deck that I think when you kind of look at its makeup, it's very similar to the deck that I played at the recent most recent Grand Prix. Uh, but kind of has a lot of benefits. Mono Red Prison wears makeup. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but it has a lot of benefits that that deck didn't have, and so it's a deck that I would be excited about playing. I think it's uh, got a lot of good matchups. We look at how fair Legacy has gotten when I was making these power rankings. Uh, it, it was crazy to me how fair Legacy is right now. Like, compared to the history of Legacy, this is the most fair I've ever seen it. Uh, and so because of that, and because when you have to beat those decks, you have to play extremely unfair decks, I really like uh, this deck's position to beat the decks that are trying to beat the good decks, and also surprisingly just having a lot of matchups, like good matchups against the good decks. Yeah, what do, you, what do you think is, like, the strength of it for the listeners? Like, like let's say you're someone who's getting new into Legacy, and you, you know Modern Red Prison in theory, like, you kind of know what's going on, but, like, what really is drawing you towards it, you know? Yeah, I think that, like, uh, just like Modern, actually being the best Chalice deck at times. So, uh, typically, the best Chalice deck has been Loam in Legacy recently. Uh, so if you're familiar with Four Color Loam, it's a deck that I've talked about in the history of the podcast. It's kind of just been the, kind of the de facto one of the best Chalice decks, if not the best one. Uh, there there are other, always been other ones, but I think that this deck has, uh, you know, a lot of similar things that it can do. You get to play Simeon Spear Guide in this deck and be pretty happy about it, which really helps your Chalice draws. You get to play, you know, obviously actual, uh, you know, two mana lands in this deck, which you didn't get to do in Modern in the decks that we were playing. So we were forced to kind of play all these all-in zero mana cards, whereas, like, in this deck, like, your zero mana card is a Chrome Box. So I, I think that the deck just... Uh, is better than the deck that I was playing in addition to, you know, having some just really powerful haymakers. I remember when Fiery Confluence was was spoiled. It was a card that I was really excited about. But yeah, you get to play the best four mana Planeswalkers yeah, in the format with one of them being a win condi like a combo condition in Karn the Great Creator. And we all know how powerful Sh uh, Chandra of Torture Defiance is. It's a card that I think that we, th this podcast talked about uh, seeing legacy play and actually being able to affect the legacy format. I remember when the first Rabble Master Red uh, prison deck came out, uh, where you know we talked about Chandra being a part of that. So, yeah, I I think the Mono Red deck has a lot of really powerful stuff, and it's interesting because I I agree that like on a and we were talking about this a little bit before we went live. Like when I think about it, I really like Mono Red a lot, and I think like. It's a deck that I'm very interested in playing. I think it's very powerful. It's very good. And then, like, I play against it, and I just keep, like, not being that impressed, and I keep winning. And I think it's probably more a symptom of the decks I'm playing uh, and probably, a you know, obviously variants. Like, it's an astronomically small sample size right. more than anything. But, like, yeah, it, it's, it's a very powerful deck that a lot of decks just can't beat, like, if we're just being honest, right? Like, there's a lot of turn one plays that just end the game immediately and force the opponent to have force of will. And then even then, that's sometimes not enough because sometimes they just do it again on the next turn. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not as all-in against Force of Will decks, right? Like, you're a fair deck where your spells have to be countered against Force of Will, which is really helpful. But, I mean, I can definitely see that, depending on the decks that you're playing, how it could be good. Did you find that you were beating it with Teamer Delver? That's actually something that w I would interest me. Uh, I have played against it twice with Teamer Delver, and both times I was able to answer Chalice. And so, I'm uh, sorry, I was able to answer Budmoon and not Chalice. And so, uh, I, I would, like, win the match, but it was normally pretty hard. Like, Tarmogoyf, Ren and Six, and stuff like that was how I was able to win the game. Uh, you know, if you can, like, like one time I ultimated my Ren and Six, so I had an emblem, and then eventually, like, I built up enough lands because they weren't doing anything because they didn't draw any threats. Because sometimes that's what happens with the deck. You just draw lands and whatnot. You emblem, and then you can, the spells you, got, you can't actually cast with a Blood Moon or something like that, you can just retrace and kill them eventually. So, okay. but yeah. And also, Dreadhorde Arcanist does some stuff to get around Blood Moon. So, like, then that does happen to you. But for the most part, I found myself able to win uh, the, those games. That's interesting to me. I would assume that's one of Mono Red Prison's good matchups. I, I, I like, yeah, that, that was just what made me think about maybe it might just be the super small sample size. The other decks I've played against it are the the basic land snow deck of four color one, sure. Miracles a bunch, and Hogak uh, Depths a bunch. Yeah, I would assume and, Miracles is a bad matchup. Yeah, that one was like almost like a joke. Like every time my opponent would put a turn one thing into play that was super like impactful, I was never able to counter it. And then Little Teferi as a backbreaker yeah. in the matchup. Spoiler alert: so. Miracles was not in the top ten decks, so that's interesting. Yeah, I think Miracles is just a little too weak right now. Like it's just a little, it's just a little underpowered. Like I really like the way Miracles plays out. And I think it's a really fun deck, and in theory, is really good. It's just like you said, the format's so fair right now, and the fair decks gotten such huge upgrades, and Miracles didn't. I think that just kind of puts miracles in a bad spot, but that's my opinion. I don't know how Trey or you feel about that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, the other decks are gaining so much advantage on a turn to turn basis. Um, and I, I think that does create a lot of difficulty, especially with there being so much four color Delver, like Leovold also hurts. I think miracles in a lot of ways, um, as far as a lot of their primary game plans. And so I think it makes it a bit hostile, um, and, you know, when you've also got now that these mid-range decks with Ren and Six are just getting a lot more value out of their lands, I think that also makes it hard for control decks to compete against. Yeah. yeah. Ren and Six, Planeswalkers are kind of generally a problem for that deck, and that I emblem think, will beat them. Yeah, I think that deck just has a bad Ren and Six matchup, if we're being honest. So it, it... Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and an interesting pairing of the two decks that we've talked about so far, really, is that any kind of show-and-tell variant is generally pretty good against the mono-red prison decks. Yeah, that's because fair. Because so much of the things they cast just don't matter to you. You yeah, don't really that, care. That's totally fair. I mean, and I think that it also attacks the format from another similar vein, right? Where, like, mono-red prison's really good against the, you know, we're going to talk about Ant here in a second because it came in with A-Place, for example, right? And, like, while mono-red prison can, like, beat Ant pretty you know, consistently because it gets to be a Chalice deck that doesn't actually matter as much as against Sneak and Show outside of the Chalice. The only thing that they care about is your Chalice. So, like, they don't even have to protect their combo. They just have to stop your Chalice, and suddenly they have a good magic wins to you. Whereas, like, against something like like Ant, like, it's an, that's not it. Like, that's not everything that's happening for you against Monterey Prism. So, well, you, you, even then, they can cast a Chalice, and you can't cantrip, and then you just cast a Show and Tell and kill them. Exactly. It is like, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I completely agree. I think it's it's interesting that these decks are uh, attacking the format in similar ways, right? Where they're, like, kind of dodging the things that are trying to, like, beat the hate and stuff like that. But I do think that Show and Tell probably has just a really good matchup there. Let's let's talk about Ant really quick. This is the deck that comes in with 22 points. Um, this deck, uh, if we look at the list that I'm looking at, we have a 5-2 playing Defense Grid and a Mox Opal in this deck. Uh, I have, I'm not going to lie, guys. Uh, seeing this list was really interesting to me. It's actually why I pulled this one up. Because uh, I have been out of the Legacy game for a little while, but I had not seen Mox Opal and Defense Grid in these decks before. Yeah, I, I haven't seen Defense Grid, I think, ever. I saw Mox Opal once recently, but Defense Grid's very interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, uh, the Mox Opal, it, the Defense Grid is even more interesting because it doesn't really help the Mox Opal. Yeah, it, it's also so it's. I get. I guess the format is just so much about fair decks, and there's so many force wills and dazes and counter spells going on that you just need to main deck defense grid. Yeah, I don't remember if it was you, Mason, or if it was Matt that I was talking to today, but we were kind of talking about uh, just the number of force of wills plus an additional main deck force of negation and force of negation in the board in some decks, and that's just a lot. Yeah, that's true. That is a lot. I think that was Matt. Yeah, but that is true. Like, the Teamer Delver deck plays, like, five to six force effects now. And that is backbreaking at times. Yeah. You, know, you need certain spells to resolve. 
And and Defense Grid is an exceptional card in that type of a situation, not just for what the card says on it, but also the fact that you can just run it out early, run your opponent out of counter spells by fighting over it, and then just go on with what it is that you're doing. Like it just right. it forces your opponent to use a lot of resources. Like it's a if they don't counter the defense grid, they lose the game. And if they do counter the defense grid, oftentimes that means they lose the game because they had to yeah. use the counter spell then they don't have any more. Exactly. And so like Defense Grid is such a powerful tool to have when you're playing against you know those counter spell decks for exactly that reason. Yeah. That makes I, I completely agree. That makes a ton of sense to me. Uh what do we think about this deck's positioning right now in the meta game? I don't know. I like obviously the deck does powerful stuff, right? Like it can very easily turn two or three your opponent, and that's very good. And it doesn't care about Ren Six, like basically at all. Like the deck plays some basics, um, so you're able to fetch those up. And then on the turn you need to go off, you can fetch your one land that would die to wasteland or whatever, and just you know use all your rituals and whatnot. I'm unsure. I don't know. The, well, the, version, I, the version that I pulled up only plays one snow-covered swamp, and that's it. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah I mean, there's, there, there's a thing that Mason and I talked about when we were talking about the Delver decks in general and what they look like now. And it, I think that this result kind of reflects some of this, is that traditionally, especially when you're looking at Legacy, like the Delver decks prey on all the combo decks, yeah. right? They're just the tempo control decks. And that's like the, the tale as old as time that those are good against combo decks. But it's interesting because of the rise of Ren and Six and the so much value that's there is that the majority of the Delver variants now look less like tempo control decks and more like mid range Jun decks. Like they may be playing Delver. They may be playing these other counter spells and things like that, but they play out much more like mid range decks than they do tempo control decks. Yeah. Especially that and disciple has gone. Right. They're, they're better at smashing against each other and trying to outvalue each other, but they do lose points against the combo decks. I think they lose points against show and tell. I think they lose points against storm. I think they lose points in a lot of those situations because they're now not structured in that kind of way. It actually makes a lot, a lot of sense as to why defense grid would have become something that you might want to try. Right. Because if you think about it, if like you're preying on the decks that are preying on Delver and then Delver suddenly is getting worse against you. And the way that, the way that they adjust for that is by playing more force effects. You're like, all right, well, screw it. I'll just be your force effect. And then you actually just can't beat me because you've built your deck to beat the mirror. Yeah. Also, I'd like to correct myself. I went through and looked at a bunch of the, excuse me, the, the ant decks and only one I saw had more than one basic in it. So it looks like everyone's adopted this one swamp plan where before okay. I know they used to play an island. But yeah, no, I, I agree with what you two just said. Um, it It is a weird, like, all right, if y'all are going to do this, I'm going to do this, you know? So, and then Mox Opal also being in the deck kind of makes sense too. Like, we, I know we kind of like mentioned it, but like now you get to go even faster. Yeah. You have another Mox, and it's not like you're playing four. You have like two or three most lists are playing, so. Yeah, I mean, and like, they, if you have two of them, they just act as other Lotus petals, right? So it just doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and they count for your storm. So, you know, yeah. I, I think the deck's totally reasonable. It's I don't know if it's better than Reanimator right now. Like I know that like point wise, whatever Reanimator ended up higher. It might be. I don't know. If I were to play a combo deck, that might be the one I play over Reanimator. Right, but well, I'm I'm not sure. We, I, mean, we'll, I guess we'll talk about that more when the time comes. Let's talk about the next deck we have coming in with 23 points. We all know this is the deck I'm gonna love. Like let's be honest. Like this is this is my jam, baby. We have four color uh, Leovold. Uh, but Leovold has taken on an interesting take in this in this specific format. Uh, I've heard this interaction talked about so many times. Now that you have Ren and Six, like the deck changes a little bit. It's actually the reason that Leovold gets to like exist in a new form again. Um, but guys, what talk to me about Dak Fade and Leovold? This is something Michael well, Handerocker, former host of the show, and I talked about. Well. First of all, I just want to talk about the naming convention that this deck is called Four Color Leovold and has one Leovold in it. <laughs> there, there are lots of lists that play two or three for what it's worth. It's <laughs> yeah, just ridiculous. You might as well call it you know, Four Color uh, Brainstorm. They, At least there's four yeah, of them. <laughs> when, I, when I was organizing decks for the what's worth, I, can, I put all the Four Color Control decks in one category. So whether or not it like played Gurmag Angler and not Tamragoyf, or whether it played... Uh, no Dak Fadens, lots of Leobolds, Jace, the Mindsculptor kind of stuff. All of those are considered four-color control because I don't think that this deck is figured out right now. Yeah, they're like four-color pile decks, yeah. kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what my thought. It was just check pile. Like, these are the check pile decks. 
Yeah. Yeah. One thing I do love seeing in these check piles is main deck plague engineer. <laughs> as I just get them, there's a lot of a lot of uh, times that that's really relevant in legacy. I've seen there's a, a lot of tribal stuff going on. Yeah, I've seen I've seen it named wizards. I've seen it named uh, humans. Man, let, let's just talk about how that swings a, a main deck matchup. When you like are this Jace the Mind Sculptor deck that has this bomby card like Plague Engineer in your deck, and you have this bad matchup against this like mostly humans deck that just completely swings the matchup. Like, man, does that does that do, do a lot of confidence for you going into a tournament with this deck? Yeah, for sure. And then, like, there's just random times where, like, creatures just overlap in types in Legacy, and you just get to get people. Or it just becomes, like, a Flame Tongue Kavu, right? Where it's, like, they have a Flicker Wisp in play, and you want to kill the Flicker Wisp. So you name Avatar, I believe, or Elemental, whatever Wisp is. And it's just like, okay, I kill that Wisp. I've now basically meddling mage Wisp unless you're willing to trade for its ETB. And now I have a two-two death touch, and it's like that. That just rate is good enough in legacy right now. Yeah. Back up with everything that this deck's doing for it to be a thing. To to mention on the Leovold aspect of the deck, the deck has this like. I'm I'm curious if I could like, is there is, there, is it easier to play Leovold than Narset? I guess is my question. I want to ask. It probably is, right? To yeah. cast like blue, well, black, green, then one of the blue. Yeah. So blue, blue would be pretty hard. To yeah. Play. So if you actually look at if you want to talk about the Grixis decks that didn't make this list, actually just didn't do as well as the four color decks they mm -hmm. are just playing two nart sets right uh okay but those decks actually haven't adopted the deck fit in technology yet so i would actually be interested to see if you're just like you know what i maybe run in six isn't worth it and like one of the things that is worth it though is tarmogoyf i think tarmogoyf is substantially better than Gurmag angler and that's something that should be mentioned here is like by doing this you not only get run in six but you get tarmogoyf over Gurmag, and i think that's an important point um, yeah i, I think Tarmogoyf yeah. is very good right now, partly because like the Delver decks are playing Arcanus, which is just like an insane card. So having something that doesn't die to bolt and is like a real beater and can block like check that in combat is very nice. Yeah. The other thing that you Aiming. get by, by doing it this way is you get punishing fire combo, which is also just very good against Delver. So you get a cutback on your baleful tricks. So there's a lot of reasons to have the deck leaning the way that it's leaning. That doesn't mean that it's right. That doesn't mean that it's better than Grixis and better than just playing the nerf set. I'm just saying the reasons that it's doing it. Yeah, and, and for anyone who, who doesn't know the Lee of old Dak Faden combo, the Dak Faden's plus, target player draws two cards, discard two cards, and then Lee of old or Narset doesn't let them draw, so you just get to free mind rot them every turn. Yeah. Yep. Uh, also, worth noting, we've hit the point in Legacy where to the slaughter is in the sideboard, and it's not surprising. It's just like, oh, yeah, I told this one in Edict that also hits their Planeswalkers. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what, crazy what a wild time. It also Three mana edicts and legacy. A lot in this deck, right? Oh, for sure. No, no. I, I'm I'm not bashing it. I'm just saying we've hit the point where planeswalkers are so good in legacy, and we have so many playable ones where it's like, oh yeah, this is just totally makes sense, and it's gonna like two for one your opponents a lot. I'm kind of glad matches. that happened to be honest. Like, if if you want legacy to get more fair, fair, making more powerful planeswalkers makes a lot of sense. Yeah. War of the Spark and um, Horizons with Ren and Six has really done that. This is our first time really talking about Ren and Six in a deck. Should we take a moment to like talk about how crazy powerful this card is? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think that uh, there are going to be two Ren and Six decks here, so I, I mean, this could be a good opportunity to talk about it. I guess there's going to be three, but yeah, yeah. Just, I, just I want to mention that. It's a card that doesn't look super strong, but I think the fact that it doesn't die to bolt gets you incidental advantage. And then the fact that it gets not only like wasteland in some decks, but like just honestly getting back your fetch lands for your brainstorms just seems to be enough. Like the list I have here, it literally just uses Ren Six to buy back lands that would get wastelanded and your fetch lands, and that's it. Yeah. Like I mean, it just getting back, like it it actually helps your deck against wasteland like quite a bit. Uh yeah, I think that its ability to actually help you against Wasteland in a deck like this while also making your better deck a better Wasteland deck is actually really interesting, right? Because, uh, like, you get a Wasteland me, but I, it doesn't stop me from casting my spells if I also have one. Yeah. Yeah, it, the card's just very strong. It, like, stops Wastelands, works well with Wasteland. Also, it we're not even talking about the minus one to ping something. is super oppressive, like... I played Teamer Delver for some, and like I played against Elves, and I, uh, I was playing with uh, Kling, and it's like, oh, this matchup used to be so bad for us, and now we have Teamer, now we have Rin Six, and it's like, oh, we just like thirteen for one them, you know? Yeah, but I, th I think that Spencer, you just touched on a really key thing, and I think that it, it reflects a lot of the reason that Legacy has developed into the metagame that it is right now, 
is that Brennan Six is a very valuable card. It lets you do a lot of grindy things and it does a lot of really powerful things against a lot of variety of different decks. It does nothing against some decks like Show and Tell, but it does do a lot against a lot of decks. But the best way to counter it is just play your own Renin Six. Yeah. Like, like if you want to counter the Renin Six, just play your own Renin Six. And then, like you said, like Wasteland Loops don't matter. You can also keep up on rate on the things that are going on from a land standpoint. And so I think that that's where things have led to this point is people are just like, well, I need to have an answer for Renin Six. What's the best answer for Renin Six? Renin Six. Yeah. Okay. Edgar Magalage got second at a face to face open playing miracles with ren and sex like <laughs> that's wild <laughs> no i i mean it actually makes a lot of sense for miracles like if you actually just think about it like what is what is your deck bad against all of a sudden and how can you like even out your deck against those things that actually makes some sense let's move on from four color because uh i'm this is probably going to be a, one of the first if not the first videos that i do with matt Kling. we'll be playing with this deck or uh talking about it so uh, let's talk really quickly about Hogak Depths, because this deck had the most points early. So if we look at the MTG results, this deck was crushing it two weeks ago. It was the best deck in Legacy two weeks ago for results. Uh, does it decrease because people who are just trying to try everything tried it and are done with it? Is the deck bad? I would say the deck can't possibly be bad. Uh, yeah. Golgari Depths is going to come in here. It's going to be part of these power rankings. And if you had to make me choose, and you told me that two weeks ago this was the best deck, now Golgari Depths is doing a little bit better because the truth is, is that we've learned the Elvish Reclaimer is insane. I still don't think that gets me off of Hogat Depths. I think that I just know that Elvish Reclaimer is insane. If I'm going to play a Depths deck, this is just one that I'm definitely going to consider. Yeah, I, I think I played a lot of Hogax Depth two weeks ago, just like everyone else did. The deck is very strong. It's very powerful. It does a lot of, like, really messed up stuff really quickly. And like you said, Elvish Reclaimer is just, like, an actual bomb card in Legacy, which is, like, oh, you know, I think that you... I don't think many people thought about when the card first was spoiled for an M20, but when you play with it, it's like, oh, this is just great. And... I think that deck is a legitimate deck. And I think there's a lot of different things you could do. Like I played a version that didn't have a in it uh, and had blood gas. And I saw a version that had the and not, and not as many blood gas. They only had like two. So it's still being figured out like what's the best way to gack plus depths. And I, I think that while well, I probably went down because a people came more prepared for it and B people just stopped playing as much. Cause like, okay, that is good. I'm going to go now that I've played this and try playing like, you know, my yeah. team or Delver deck with that, that information. That was my assumption. But Trey, really quickly, just because I want your opinion on this. You're our GAC, resident GAC expert on the podcast. Uh, you know, GAC Depths comes in with 25 points, most of it coming from two weeks ago. Golgari Depths comes in with 29 points. Um, you, you know, we're going into an event, you and me. We're going to play Legacy. We're going to the MCQ together. I'm like, Trey, here's the thing, man. Like, I'm just going to play Golgari Depths because, you know, this deck has higher points in the power rankings. Convince me to play gap depths. Yeah, I mean, I think that what it is is you're getting a choice of like having a, a consistent and and uh, consistency versus power, right? Like the gap depths deck has like alternate different types of attack plans that are both very powerful, and it's a little bit less consistent than the Golgari depths deck. I don't think it's less consistent by a lot, but I do think that there's a loss of consistency because while the plans overlap with each other, they're not entirely consistent. Um, and so you're really just being able to have like these two alternate ways to attack and then having those kinds of things make it harder to hate out when you're looking at that different kind of strategy. And so I think that that's one of the reasons that the GAC depths is a, is a draw versus the Golgari depths. Yeah. It, it's interesting to me, uh, you know, to be fair, it, you just have to tell me that Golgari depths, uh, plays dark confidant and I'll be off the deck. So it's, it's actually not that thing to do. <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't know the argument was so easy to win. Yeah, but that being said, it, one of the benefits in the fact of Golgari Depths that I think that we can just kind of segue to because I think these decks are so closely related right now is that it does get to play Rough Decay. Yeah, that's huge, right? Like Teamer, like De Delver decks. There's a lot of decks right now that Rough Decay just knocks something out of the park on. There's these other decks that are trying to you know put in these things that uh, Rough Decay blows up, and I think it's a totally reasonable card. Like. It's hard for a bunch of kid to be kind of bad in legacy, right? Like things have to be really messed up for that card to not be well positioned. Yeah, I mean it just has value against everything all the time. Yeah, Mason, which would you play? 
Um, probably Hogak Depths because I played it more, and I know that Golgari Depths definitely rewards having the reps, as I imagine Hogak Depths does as well. So having you know even just those extra like forty or fifty games under my belt, I think would be helpful. Plus, I like I am sometimes willing to give up consistency for power, and between knowing one deck better and having that kind of a draw, I'd be willing to give up like trace of the consistency of depths for the power of Hogak. Sure. Well, let's, let's move on really quickly to a deck that I requested from a wizard of close employee this week to be banned. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, I'm not the only person to suggest this, but Rectus reanimator comes in next. Uh, so we kind of just to uh, wrap this up because we kind of jumped around a bit. We have Ant coming in at eighth, four color control coming in at seventh, Gak coming in at sixth. Now we have Black Red Reanimator coming in at fifth. Uh, I believe this deck should just be banned. I think that it's not a good deck. Um, I actually know it's not a good deck. I think that it doesn't have a very. It has a. I don't. It does not have a positive win percentage in Legacy. I would assume, and uh, I think that the deck should just be banned because it ruins games of Legacy uh, due to its cost rather than actually being good. Uh, and it actually hurts the format by existing because you should not metagame against it. When you say that it hurts it by its cost, what do you mean in that regard? It costs no money. And it, and it has a cost to the format. Like, like the idea of this deck existing uh, and, and the way that it exists, right? Like, Especially now that they've been Gitaxian Probe, right? They actually cut out a version of this deck that was actually weak to Force of Will that was better than this deck. And now this deck exists almost solely in that spot. Uh, and it was already kind of creeping into some of that spot uh, with being a worse deck. And I, I, I think that, like, I, I talked, Matt is actually the one that convinced me of this for what it's worth. Was His opinion was this deck is so bad, but you. So you shouldn't prepare for it. You just have to know that it, know that it exists and do what you can for it, while also just kind of ruining games of Magic by being this turn turn zero turn one deck or turn one deck that like doesn't care about a lot of the things that you can do to beat it. So would you say the same thing about Charbelcher? Uh, so Charbelcher doesn't exist anymore, right? Because they banned Gitaxian Probe. Sure, that's true. I mean, but Char Charbelcher and Ubsol spells for folded to Force Will automatically. Not not automatically. I mean, I've watched Charbelger win tournaments through Force of Wills. Sure. Like, like they had plans through it. I I, I mean I I I have, I owned Oopsol spells as long as it was legal. So like I played a lot of that deck. Uh, I, I unsleeved it last week. Oh yeah, that's my boy. Me and Trey right here, baby. See, this is us learning about each other, Trey. No, like I I played a lot of Oopsol spells. Like you you oh, Oopsol spells by the way was the better version of Charbelcher because it could be Force of Will a lot better than Charbelcher could. So my um my question was more, do, so do you think that decks that can end the game immediately like that and create non games shouldn't exist? This, is, this, is that this deck doesn't have any play to it. Like it's like every single game, it's going to do the exact same thing. I mean, if you just look at this deck sideboard, like it does not care what you're doing. Like it, it actually is just ignoring you. Whereas like. Like Charbelcher and stuff would like board in Xanthid Storm and like would play their deck on a turn or two differently according to whether or not they were playing against a Force of Will deck. Like th this deck does not do that. Uh, it it I think it's actually bad for Magic. Well, let me ask this in a different way, not as such an extreme example, but like taking it back to Show and Tell, because this is something that I've regularly said about that deck. Like that does does nothing but win and lose. It doesn't do anything else. All it does is win and lose. I think that the deck has a lot of interesting and so decision points and how you play against show and tell with different decks uh, can be different. Whereas I don't get to play against this deck. Yeah, but I think your opponent's choices are more interesting, I think, than yours are sometimes in the show and tell deck. Like you literally are, are structuring things in a very similar way almost every game. And, and again, it doesn't interact. It doesn't care what you're doing most of the time. It doesn't really do anything. Like it just, it casts a spell and if that sure. spell resolves, it wins. And if it doesn't resolve, it loses. Yeah, so... Uh, to be clear, I'm just going to say what Matt Kling's opinion is, uh, because I, I agree with it. Uh, I think that when a bad deck does this, and it becomes part of the metagame, it is worse for the gameplay of the format overall. That doesn't mean that I think this deck is too powerful, because I don't. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this deck is unfun. It doesn't add to my enjoyment of the format. 
Uh, it's not a deck that I think that anyone should be playing because it's not good. Like, I think that you could make an argument to play Belcher or play Oops All Spells. I don't think that you can make an argument to play Rakdos Reanimator. I don't think that it's good in this meta. I don't think it's been good in any of the metas that it's been in. But it ruins games of Magic uh, that you just don't have control over. So just just to clarify, Mono Red Prison is different because it is good in the metagame, right? So that that's like the, the crux of it, is that like contextually Mono Red Prison interacts with the format in a certain way. It also and interacts it create, with it creates the format, right? Like yeah. that's that's also a separate issue, right? This deck also doesn't interact with the format. Well mono mono red prison doesn't interact. I mean specifically doesn't interact. It wants everyone well, it to not interact. From interacting, right? But that is interaction in itself. Okay. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that I think the problem that Mason and I are both having is not necessarily with the point that you're making about this deck, but that uh, that taking that logic, like how does that apply to the rest of the format, and sure. what is it that distinguishes this deck from those decks? Yeah, I, I mean, I also think that it has to do with enjoyment, right? Like, I, I think that uh, you know, if we're looking at a format like Legacy, I can't just look at it in the context of of power level. I think that at some point, like, we have to admit that this is just a different format. And that we need to admit, like, when this is just not fun, this is taking away from this experience that only so many people get to experience at this point, and we should fix that. I, I'm more lenient with bans in Legacy than I am in other formats. Yeah, but I mean, so I see what you're saying is like the idea that this is just going to play like a turn one Grizzle Brand is is like not particularly fun for your opponent because there's not anything that they can do about it if they don't have an interaction spell. But what I'm saying as well is I also played a deck this weekend that I played a turn one Grizzle Brand against my opponent. It's, they didn't have an interaction. Just, it's not just the Grizzle Brand, right? Like the Chancellor of the Annex itself, like it adds up to, it's kind of funny because you mentioned two decks that kind of combined to do what this deck does. Like if you look at Prison and you look at Show and Tell, if you combine them, you actually kind of get something similar to this. Yeah, I, I get, I, I think I figured out where you're coming from. I just didn't quite understand it first, but now I think I understand what you're saying. I don't know if I agree at the moment, but I, I do get where you're coming from now. Where the the yeah the problem that's, being like that's my you know. soapbox. I'll get off it for the rest of forever, and we can kind of just talk about this deck. I think this deck is a bad choice, and you shouldn't play it. Yeah, I, I think this deck only makes sense if like it's the only deck you own in Legacy, and Legacy is expensive, and you want to play Legacy. Like, if you own this deck, I get it. I understand why you're playing it. It is very expensive to buy in other decks. I do agree that this deck. Um, basically only puts you to the test on mulliganing and cabal therapy and as such like you don't have a whole lot of play so if you're not okay with your like your decisions like your play not dictating how you do in the tournament more yeah. your mulliganing decisions doing that kind of stuff then and, this isn't the deck for you and we're probably being a little unfair like unmask is like actually kind of an interesting card you have like interesting thoughts these decisions but i, I mostly agree with what you're saying here well, yeah. I want to I want to compare it. Let's take it outside of this format and compare it to something else because I think that it's a pretty fair comparison to compare this to like Neoform and Modern, right? Yeah, because both I think that, yeah. I mean, but people, but I think people. I think from a game plan standpoint, they're very similar. Yeah. But the the difference being is that I think that there is a lot more things going on with this deck that make this deck better than the Neoform deck yeah. because it has more types of things that it can do. I you love, also have more answers. I love your comparison yeah. even more because people are already saying that even though Neoform is bad, it should be banned from, from Modern just because of how unfun it is to play against. Like, people already say that. I wonder... I I know yeah. this is like an unfair like thing and we could like never really know because no one's going to do the work on it. But I wonder if I had actual factual like days in Force of Will in Modern, if I would care about Neoform. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Because like right. it's weird because Neoform dies to the IOK decks, which are like days and like the days thoughts of these decks basically. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It, it's hard to know because the whole format, everything changes so much. But like that's part of the thing with uh, Red Black Reanimator is like I played against this weekend and I lost game one on turn zero, Spencer. My opponent literally killed me on turn zero. I had no interaction. Because I kept a hand that was totally reasonable. Because Trey said he played against a guy playing four color Delver who was super nice, and this guy knew Trey, so I got got. <laughs> and then game two and three, <laughs> I, I, I hard into a dagger. I died on turn zero. Screw you, Trey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had never told Trey that till right now. I was waiting for the show to tell him. Uh, but either way, like I'm, then I hard mulligan game two and three, and because I hard mulligan, like I kept a hand of like days, days, surgical force, spell pierce, Delver land, and I was like, let's go. And like it is, it is kind of lame that I have to do that. Sure. But at least I can. Yeah. And that's I think I think that's the difference for me is that like if I think if I couldn't answer Red Black Reanimator, I'd be with you. And if it was better, if it was good, if it was like a real it's deck actively bad and it just means that sometimes I'm gonna lose matches of magic, 
for no reason at all. Like, I'm going to yeah. lose to a bad deck that shouldn't be in the format. Like, I, I mean, it's I'm also okay. why I don't like Modern, right? Because, like, sometimes you're going to just, like, lose to Ponza at a Grand Prix with, like, this really good deck choice. And you're like, all right, well, I guess this is my life. Well, once again, Hoback yeah. doesn't cost mana Ponza guy. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah I, mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I get into a situation where, like, I, I have a real hard time, like, looking at bannings for, for an unfun experience. The only time that I was really in a in a pro situation of banning something for being unfun was Aetherworks Marvel, because I thought That's it was unfun deck. to play. What is happening on this podcast? I thought it was unfun to play against, and I thought it was unfun to play with. So um, just for the record, Trey's okay with KCI, Todd. <laughs> Like these well, are yeah. these things trade about, but no, Marvel. no, those things I think are all fine because I think that those things, yes, while those can be very particularly unfun to play against, I do not think that they were particularly unfun for the pilots themselves. Like if you're the type of person that wanted to play that type of deck, there was enjoyment there. Like I, th I found Aetherworks Marvel to be an unpleasant experience for both the pilot and the opponent, and and that's the difference. And so like with this type of a deck, you know, there are people that like like this kind of thing. Just the idea of putting a big monster into play on turn one gets people excited, so that they are getting enjoyment from the experience even if you as the opponent are not just over under i'm sorry continue oh, i was gonna say just to be clear i'm off my soapbox i'm not talking about this anyway All right. don't tweet I, I, at me i'm not like i this is just like where i feel and i'm not yeah. talking about it but let's talk about the new if you board. love reanimator have, tweet at spencer howland <laughs> i have a i have a question yeah you sit down at a legacy mcq your opponent has a monster energy play mat and hat on over under they're playing red black reanimator and next up, <laughs> over. we have. The over. <laughs> next up, we have a story. I saw play. that happen. <laughs> we, we I'm have, sorry. We have a Zoria Stoneblade next, Mason. This is the, uh, this... the new hotness right now in modern. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, this deck does play Narset, but I'm with Matt Kling. What is happening? Why are people playing the very time traveler in Legacy? <laughs> Well, your this... opponents don't get to date or force you, right? And the unsummon is kind of reasonable in a couple spots, including uh, Merit Lage. I don't. I. I mean, the, it's good in this deck because it buys back your Snapcaster Mages, uh, and it's fine against Merit Lage. But like, I feel like you already have you know answers for that card, right? Like you already had well, Council's Judgment. You already had Force of Will for their crop. Like I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, think about this. Like, if you were already, we we're already talking about how like defense grid is good. Yeah. For certain types of decks, and so if defense grid is good, Teferi has to also be good. That's actually fair. Like, I like that. I like that point. Yeah. You yeah. trade with coming at me with the knowledge that I presented. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think the stone blades are like hot m above medium is what I would say. Like, I don't think they're medium. But I think they're like just above good. Like a bunch of medium, they're reasonable decks. They're like fun to play, and people like playing them. I know a couple of weeks in the podcast I talked about how I was playing them recently. I haven't played it since then, uh, but I think it's like totally reasonable right now. Yeah. I, I think if you want to play a miracles type deck, this is the blue white deck you're allowed to play. And I think so, playing a deck with a bunch of basics in a Ren six world and only creature that dies to Ren six is Snapcaster Mage is nice. Okay. Uh, summary summary of Stoneblade's whole history uh, above medium. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, when like all of a sudden. Cheater McCheaterson decided to play this at a legacy event. Uh, he definitely won the whole thing. And Whoa, then, when we're allowed to cheat, our decks are better? Yeah. Holy. And then other Cheater McCheaterson won a bunch of events with this deck. L listen, if we're just going to say Cheater McCheaterson, that's not specific enough for me to know who you're talking Alex, about. Alex, Mc, Alex McBurton Cheney was, the, was one of them. Uh, that that did that, but it was uh I don't remember Mike's last. It it was it also Mike Flores. I feel like it was other Mike Flores. I, I never heard of other. Who's Mike other Flores. Mike Flores? <laughs> I, I love, I love <laughs> the idea. There's other Mike Flores in Magic. Like he sits and like, no, I'm not that Mike Flores. <laughs> I I had never heard of this this Mike Flores. It was while you were on the SCG tour. Last week. What was his name? He like played. <laughs> I was talking to Trey while Trey was oh, top editing, while old man out. Trey was top editing SCGs. What was his name? Other Mike Flores. He got banned for magic. What was his name? Oh, uh, I mean, there was a bunch of people that got banned. I know, but it was it was like Mike on the SCG. All right, so we had to edit out Mason's insane laughter there, but it was Edgar Flores that like. Uh, I think it was him. Patrick Chapin also played that deck at that first Legacy. Do you not remember the weekend I'm talking about when Batter Skull broke into Legacy and like it just completely destroyed the format for a couple weeks? No, like, I know what you're talking modern. about. Modern. 
<laughs> Apologies to the other Mike Flores. Yeah, the <laughs> one that doesn't exist. My bad. Yeah, there's a Mike Flores oh. listening to the podcast, and they're like, what did I do? <laughs> He's probably out there. He's down there in St. Petersburg, Florida, being like, hey, I was just minding my own business. I don't know what's going I'm on. I'm not cheating, guys. <laughs> or they're like, I'm the other, other Mike Flores. <laughs> Yeah, or he's down there right now grabbing his burn bag, and he's like, they know, and he's out on the streets. Can we talk really quickly about something that we kind of – there was a small discussion about in our Discord. Uh, if you go to the show notes, you can actually join our public Discord. Every listener is welcome. Uh, awesome place to talk about magic. Uh, but I have a question. Why Why is this better than Just Guy? It seems so much worse than having Red Blast. Red and Six is the only thing I can figure out. That's like the, the the reason I've been told but is like the basic. You could, you could, but you play more basics in Jeskai than you do in Blue White. I mean, you play as many. Like the Jeskai deck plays Blood Moon sometimes. Yeah, I, I I do not know for I do not have the expertise. What I was told is is that we like the extra basics and we like dodging yeah. the Ren and Six card. I don't know that Michael Hinderocker guy, but I definitely told him Ren and Six surviving Lightning was Lightning Bolt was a mistake. I know he didn't design that card, but I definitely told him this weekend. Yeah. Michael definitely told me that too. <laughs> he like, he was like, I mean, he was like, that surviving lightning bolt is cool. <laughs> Hashtag Watsy staff man. <laughs> Hashtag Watsy uh, contract. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Mm. Hire him again, and you will have this problem. No, I, I think this deck is actually pretty good. One thing that is not in this that I wanted to talk about though, and since like we're at our first ponder deck, that's not uh. That's not sneak and show. I think this is a good time to talk about this. What do you guys think of Arkham Satan's replacing Ponder in the three color and four color versions of both Stoneblade? Uh, I know that I saw a Bant Stoneblade deck playing it. I know that I play. I saw four color playing it. Uh, Astroblade. Astroblade. Sorry. Thank you. I, I was I was looking for the cards in the deck. Keep talking. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, that yeah. So the the snow the snow permanent uh, draw card replacing Ponder in these style of decks. And giving you like a really really good out to uh, Ren and Six, while also uh, fixing your mana, drawing cards, stuff like that. Also makes your voice bigger. It's don't true. sleep on it. It's true. I mean, I don't know how it's going to your graveyard, but I'm moving the discard because <laughs> <laughs> I have so many lands in my hand from Ren and Six. But legitimately, that's something that's seen play in this form. It's something uh, that I'm interested in. What do you guys think? I I think Astral Lab is quite good. Like like you said, it kind of helps beat Ren and Six because you're not getting weight. Like your basic can't get wasted to death, and as such, like you're most likely able to cast your two color spells because you'll build your mana base in such a way where yeah. like you have one of them at the time, and the Astral Lab will be the other in a weird way. So it's nice to have that, and it replaces itself. And while you do lose a powerhouse like Ponder, I think if you think the format is super fair like this. And you think the format's about Wasteland Ren Six, which it is, this makes more sense. Where like maybe in past formats, if I told you I'm gonna play a one mana uh prismatic what's it called? Uh prophetic prism, you know, in legacy, you wouldn't be about it. But now you're like, okay, given the context, I think this makes sense. If things change, we might want to reevaluate. But for now, I like it. I don't know if it's right, but I, I like where it's at. Trey, I don't know. The... I, I'm team I'm team ponder. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, Trey, you and me, we've we've lived that ponder Jace the Mind Sculptor life. We know what it's about. Mason over here doesn't like cantrips. Convince me that Ponder is the correct play here. Yeah, I mean, especially in like the these decks, right? Like you're playing multiple different kinds of cantrips. And one of the reasons that that's good is because of the way that all of them line up together, right? Like, you know, let's say you've got a Brainstorm and a Ponder and you don't have a fetch land, and you want to try to get rid of things so you can get fresh draws. Like you get the, the shuffle, you get all kinds of different things that stack together. You can also sequence them to dig like extremely far into your deck, right? Like if you go on a turn, if you go preordain into ponder, you can dig down five cards into your deck or six cards into your deck in a single turn. Like the amount of selection that you get is so strong that I think you're taking a pretty significant hit to downgrade that to Astrolabe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in and like, I, I don't know, like, yes, there's wastelands and yes, you can have a lot of wastelands and all of those kinds of things. And yes, the wastelands are coming back, but like, Honestly, like playing around Wasteland in Legacy is a fundamental skill of Legacy. Like that's not a new thing. That's not a new thing that you have to be worried about. Like being able to effectively play around Wasteland is a like a, it's like an entry point level thing that you have to do in order to play Legacy. I think yeah, but that playing around Wasteland, yeah, every and Crucible of Worlds. Is <laughs> yeah, not an yeah entry it, point it, of I agree that to play around four Wastelands, they and one, they have to draw the you know the first and the second one is a fundamental skill when they have a like new game rule where it's every turn i can wasteland you if i want 
you have to admit that's a little harder to play around. Well, it, it is, but here's the difference of why I think that that's different than it would be in other formats is that uh, is that legacy decks operate at low mana, right? And yeah. so if you if it's you go and get a base basic... better though at the same time, right? Because well, you operate I mean, a lower mana, it also makes extra blade better. It makes but the, that fixing is certainly there, but like you know, you if you have like one or two basics that can effectively cast the things that you need to cast, like you know, then then I'm not worried about it overall. Like you just have to construct your construct your mana bases in a way with that in mind, and then you get to play the more powerful cantrips. That was a good discussion. I'm glad. I'm glad we got to talk about that. Let's talk about Golgari Depths next. We already talked about it a little bit. Uh, I know that Trey and I, uh, I kind of had Trey lead the way there. But talk to me really quick, Mason. Uh, you know, let's give you the shot here. This deck has a much better and different kind of sideboard than Golgari, than, than uh, Gak Depths, I should say. Yes, the Golgari. I'm sorry. <laughs> All these decks are like so similar, and I keep moaning us with the names. The Deaths deck gets to play cards that are like kind of a little bit more real on the sideboard, I would say, for the most part. Like, you get to play cards like Plague Engineer, you get to play like Liliana the Last of, you're playing him to Torok. And then instead of having to play like weird things that uh, might get around some of the stuff that your Hogax and your Merrill Edge are weak to, but this deck also does like Sylvan Safekeeper, etc. You get to play some more interactive games as well, just by the nature of it, because you don't have to play things like Stitcher Supplier. Uh, Seda Wayfinder in your deck. Sure. I I think as we talk about this more, I like this deck a little more. I'm just scared to play it because I think it's very hard to play. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, and that's not, you know, normally I'm excited about that kind of challenge, but this deck seems very hard because like, with crop rotation, you basically have access to like everything that matters in your deck at all times. Yeah. And there are so many like random little things you can play and go into, and there's you have to play on all these wastelands. I think it's very telling how good this deck is. That there is the card that's defining the format is Renin Six with R Wasteland, and we are playing the deck that has like two basic, it has two cards in the deck that don't die to that. You know, I think that's telling. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I, I will say that I'm a little scared of a idea of playing a crop rotation deck in a uh, five force format. Yeah, I agree. I think that this deck. Uh, I mean, when you guys were talking earlier, you guys pretty much convinced me that I would rather play Gak Depths if I was going to play a Depths deck. Uh, I think that it's... I mean, even though Gak falls to the same thing, right, where you, like, get Force Will and you're like, oh, man, I'm, like, pretty far behind now. It's like, also, I get to do that faster. Your Force Will deck cannot beat an 8-8. So, like... <laughs> Trace it. For those, for those watching the video podcast, Trey is shaking his head. No, they cannot. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Teamer Delverdeck looks at that eight eight. It's like, well, this was fun. <laughs> well, what let, a world. <laughs> let's talk really quickly, Mason. I'm gonna say something, and then right. you're gonna want to respond. Ooh, okay. So, uh, in second place, we have Teamer Devil with 33 points, and in first place, we have Four Color Devil with 49 points. I had a conversation with somebody today about this. I believe there is actual zero reason to play Teamer Delver at this point. I think it's just the wrong choice. Uh, if you have the funds and the means to play the other deck, you should just play four color. We actually already talked about the main reason why. Red and six is good against red and six. It's the best way to combat red and six. When you look at something uh, like Team or Delver, you know the thing, the things that you're getting just kind of don't outweigh the things that you're losing. To me, you know, I saw versions with abrupt decay. I saw versions, uh, you know, all over the place with different cards that you could be playing in the four color versions that made me think, well, may maybe there's just not a reason at this point. Uh, Mason, however, I think you might have a different point. No. Oh, <laughs> you actually agree? Well, I, I just played, I just played Team Redelver because Trey had all the cards and <laughs> Good I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to have to like make a big order from the great people at Oasis Games. You go to OasisGames.com and get your order too. Um, and I like, wanted to try that deck out because uh, I'm preparing for like a legacy GP and a legacy SCG. And it seemed like the easier one. Plus I wanted to just see, like I had a theory that the four color one was better, but normally in my head, like if I can play less colors, I'm kind of a fan of it. Uh, but the team or Delver deck, it doesn't have a problem against Ren six as long as it draws Ren and six. But when it doesn't draw Ren and six, it has a huge problem because you only have six actual lands in your deck that make mana. Yeah. Because I'm not counting Wasteland. Like you can use it for Arcanist, but like it doesn't really make mana. Yeah. So like I would say the the only if, if you like put a gun to my head and made me tell you something about 
uh, like why you should play Team Redelver over the four color deck. I would say simply the fact that the mana is a little bit better. That's true. But that's like the only thing. And with Astrolabe and Basics, if you go that route, or just more Woo! Basics and Basics, another there's like a couple of different routes you can take this. I think you can buy. I think you can like sidestep that. And while Tarmogoyf is like really well positioned right now, while Rain Six is really well positioned, those decks can do that as well. So that's where I'm at. I, I do want to say at least one small thing about Tarmogoyf right now. Tarmogoyfs and Legacy have never been bigger than they are right now. Yeah, that's true. L like, because there are more artifacts that are seeing play, there are so many more Planeswalkers that are seeing play, um, Tarmogoyfs are pretty regularly 6-7s, like, pretty yeah. quickly. I, I noticed an increase in Spell Snares that were seeing play between both the four-color versions, the Stoneblade decks, and the Teamer Delver decks. And I was like, man, this is a lot of this. And then I was like... Yeah. Oh, the, you know, every deck is playing like lots of Dreadhorde Arcanus, lots of Renin Six, lots of this. All makes sense. Like, I, it's, I, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sorry, it's Spell Ren. It hits Ren Six. <laughs> it's like yeah. the format's defined by like all two mana things, just like you said. And it's just like, oh, because I I saw a list too where I think it was No Walkers had like two of them in the main deck. I was like, that's a lot. And then I looked at all the decks. I'm like, well, maybe that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking at You're this always list. up a mana. This Just list, saying. this uh, I don't know whose list this is. It's the fifth place in Richmond is that Noah's? Uh, yeah, the team or Nova list is Noah. Yeah, so he's got like that spell snare. I saw another list that uh, was in the Legacy Challenge. I think played two of them, and I was just like, this is so many. I don't know what's happening. Uh, but it, oh. makes, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the 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 list that went seven one in the challenge uh, played two spell snare and two spell pierce. Also, just uh, you know, for anyone who cares, that card counters no spells and show and tell ever. That's true. That's very true. Already dropping the knowledge, fam. <laughs> uh, Until they adopt Ren Six. Yeah, I, I also think that I also think that I mean, personally, as somebody that like is very interested in playing this four color deck, not just because I think the deck is the kind of deck that I would enjoy, just because I think it has like uh, good matchups in this format right now. Uh, I'm very interested to see if these Delver decks get to hold as much as this as they did. I always thought that Delver was one of the best decks, but it had to play cards like Nimble Mongoose, which, like, just in Legacy are just subpar. Like, that's just not good enough in Legacy. And it was kind of this holdover from older formats. Uh, and getting to get away from that with Dark Ar Arcanist and get away from that with, uh, I mean, obviously, Grixis Delver just completely went away from it, being this, you know, young Pyromancer deck for a long time with... Uh, with Deathrite Shaman, uh, and then I even continued, Shaman. and then continued after Deathrite Shaman. What were you gonna say, Mason? I was saying, and then Deathrite Shaman came along, and you're not allowed to play Young Pyromancer again. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that Delver, Team or Delver getting something other than Nimble Mongoose, and actually having to make a decision there just makes the deck better by having competition with itself to improve. Yeah, well, I think you know Trey mentioned it earlier on the podcast. So I don't want to like harp on it for too long, but Team or Delver like. I never really played the old version, but everyone always told me like a tempo get em, stifle deck. Da, 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 da. And then I played my deck and I was like, I'm a Jun deck doing Jun things. Yeah. Like that's how it feels when you play the deck. And at first I didn't want to say anything because I was like, maybe I'm just doing it wrong. And then I was like playing and I'm like, no, I'm just a Jun deck. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a different deck. True. These four color yeah. Delver decks are very much like that. The Timor Delver decks are very much like that. And if we're all going to be like that, that's once again why I like that four color control deck. Yep, I agree. Uh, also, when I just realized I, I forgot to mention the, the, one of the best things about Plague Engineer is, I mean, like these four color decks, is it just beats one of your worst card, the hardest cards for you to beat, which is True Name Nemesis. Yeah, I mean, it you, kills True Name. It uh, isn't Dread Horror Arcanist also a. Uh, I believe uh, all. Yeah, it's yeah, also I believe a wizard, in, so it puts its power to zero. Uh, True Name's a wizard as well, right? Is True Name also a wizard? No, it's I think not. it it's is. Because I think my opponent had one in play, yeah, and I was Merfolk. very upset. It's a Merfolk. No, it's a it's a okay. My bad. I thought it was a Merfolk wizard. Man, that card would be so good against this deck. <laughs> what am I thinking of? Oh, I'm thinking of Vendillion Click or something it, like that. Vendillion Click is a wizard. That's what it was. Okay. Sorry. I, I knew there that I had like a two and a blue thing. That was the three one. I was like, I was so upset. But <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, sorry. We, just, we were about to harp in the end of the format. Also, Plague Engineer, I know we mentioned it a little bit in passing. We've been like really harping on Ren Six. Plague Engineer is one of the most powerful cards added to Modern. I'm sorry, to Modern and Legacy. Yeah. And the four color deck gets to play that. Yep. And that, and that fixes a lot of the bad matchups. Like elves doesn't get to exist because these two cards are there, and elves could overpower these decks in the past. So, yeah. 
Well, let's let's wrap this up. I think we have Delver decks coming in at the top. We have Death's deck probably coming in next. Uh, then we have Stoneblade, Four Color Control, Ant, Monored Prison, and Sneak and Show kind of coming in the rear. Legacy is very different than it was uh, not too long ago, and it's exciting. It's something that I'm excited to play the challenges of. Uh, is there anything that you guys want to say about this before we move on? Uh, the only thing that I would say is that from from my standpoint, you know, Legacy is very fair right now. It's not very enticing for me to be fair in Legacy since there's been such an emphasis of those kinds of things happening in other formats. Legacy is a place where you can be unfair, and I don't know why you wouldn't do it. Sure. I'm going to tell the truth. Trey's got show and tell on his arm tattooed. He ain't getting off that deck unless it's stone cold <laughs> unplayable. That's just where we're at. And that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. I don't have Trey's <laughs> choice. I think that that's a deck that I'll be, I'll be trying recently in Legacy as well. Like, I, I plan on playing all of these decks, getting to know them a little bit better and becoming a better Legacy player as I kind of make the switch to the MTGO uh, grinder weekend life. So, Yeah, but just to say, like, turn being able to turn two people is nice. And that deck can also fight through hate, which is cool. Yeah. But, I, yeah. Yeah. Also, that deck can, in fact, hard cast uh, Gristlebrand if you, in a hot spot. So, you know. I can cast Emrakul, too. I definitely. Have, I have done it. Yeah, I uh, definitely have done that also. So. I, I do. I, I want to say there was this the very brief uh, adventures in show and tell story. Uh, I had a game where I was playing against Painter Stone, and my opponent uh, was trying to grind me out and would just hit, hit an Emrakul every time, and I would shuffle my deck back in. And so he was just attacking me with a, uh, a Goblin Welder every turn. And one turn he didn't. I played a land. I popped five fetches. I went to one. I hard cast omniscience and then killed him. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, I'm really excited for this week's Patreon only, or this month's Patreon only episode. We're actually going to be do a limited episode as suggested to us by Robbie. So thank you so much to Robbie. If you want to listen to that episode, you have to become a patron at patreoncom ccmtg. But that's it for this week. You can find me at Spencer H. You can find Mason at Mason. Uh, e Clark. E Clark. I'm. I was like, ah, I'm gonna make a mess up with this Twitch. You can find him at the Mason Clark on Twitch. You can find Trey at Trey MC. Uh, you can find me on Twitch at uh, twitchtv ccmtg Is where we'll be streaming. Uh, the every week we'll be stream. Well, every week that we do it, I should say, we'll be streaming a uh, constructed clash. And the weeks that we don't do constructed clash, we'll actually probably just be streaming with me and Matt to just be trying a deck out. So, uh, check check that out. And yeah, uh, should we talk about what we would play and why as we say goodbye? Let's do it. Would you would like to go first, Spencer? Uh, yeah, this was actually in our uh, Constructed Critics group. There was a question about what we would play in Standard and Modern, and I answered it pretty honestly. I've been on Mono Red for a little while. Um, I'm on a 19 land Mono Red deck with three <laughs> Experimental Frenzies, two. Is it Chandra Aklad of Flame that's the three mana one? I believe so. Yeah, so I've been playing this list uh, in modern. No, in standard. Uh, and John plays Acolyte of Flame sometimes. Yeah. Let it be known. Continue. <laughs> and uh, my win percentage, I think, is uh, quite a bit above seventy right now. And uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I'm really enjoying. It's something that I get a lot of games in really fast. And I think Acolyte of Flame. Yeah, I played against today. I was playing Gruul as I was kind of just thinking about Gruul and the things I can be doing though. And I played against the um, the Calamities deck. I don't know if you guys have seen that deck in Standard. Uh, it's the two man enchantment that whenever a creature attacks, it does one damage to you. Um, and it's a really interesting inclusion now that we look at you know Goblin Chain Whirlers rotating and things like that. We look at the three mana spells that we have for a deck like Mono Red, and you're kind of trying to top out. And it makes Phoenix a lot better. Like if we're just looking at Chandra's Phoenix, uh, Acolyte or you know that card really helps out. And so I think Mono Red. I kind of talked about. I did a video on it last week that you can check out on the YouTube channel. But I think Mono Red is a deck that I'm going to be playing going forward for a little while in Standard. And in Modern, uh, if people are going to be trying to do Stoneblade stuff and being tapping out against my my Ramp deck, I'm just going to play a Ramp deck. I'm going to play Escape Shift. Uh, I think Escape Shift is at an all-time high in Modern right now. You're already good against Dredge when people try and do the Dredge stuff. Dredge has just always been one of your best matchups with Escape Shift. Uh, you also are uh, good against Tron and Jund, which are going to just be naturally great decks. And then if people are going to be playing two mana one twos, I just want to be ramping that turn and just saying, good luck, like, this is not going to work out for you. Do you think Dredge is still, like, really good yes i think like, that, yeah. 
I think that this had zero impact on Dredge at all. You already had too many one drops to the point in Dredge where you like you were like, sometimes I want to play Horn, sometimes I want to play something else. So you're just gonna just play the good one drops. Horn is really good in Dredge. Like I know it was bad in Hogak, but like Horn Horn is like good in Dredge. Yeah. No, I, I think that's true. Shriekhorn is actually legitimately good in Dredge. I mean, you still have Cathartic Reunion. You have other one-drop options if you want them. I mean, there's lots of different things yeah. that could be played in that slot. You know, Dredge wasn't really playing Stitcher Supplier. Could play Stitcher Supplier now if it wants. Can play Thought yeah. Scour if it wants. I think too many one-drops for what it's worth, right? Like, you already have Neonate and Horn. Like, you could yeah. play A or two... Stitcher Supplier, I agree with Trey. Right, what I'm saying is is that you have more options to play yeah. in that slot if yep. you want to fill those things in exactly. in a way that you don't even necessarily need to. Yeah. Are you on Dredge for what it's start with, Trey? Sorry? What? Would you play Dredge? I, I don't I mean, I, I'd like to say no, but I mean, odds are odds are high that I'm probably going to be playing some type of Dredge. Honestly, the, the deck that I'm really curious about trying to put some time in with right now is Wurza. Sure. Um, I, I think that Wurza gained a lot by this announcement, and like you said, if people are going to be playing one twos into their batter skulls, like making infinite tokens and yeah. killing them, seems like a, a a good place to be. It's the same kind of idea yeah. as the ramp decks, just in a different strategy. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I think that Wurza is something that I'm interested in trying to put some time into because it was a deck that intrigued me before, uh, but I just had literally no incentive to put time into it. You know, while there was GAC available. Yeah. One thing that I will say, the deck that I played this weekend in Charge Tron, I don't think got hurt too much. Like, Tron becomes more popular, which is, like, one of your bad matchups. But you're actually good against a lot of the other decks. Uh, so I think Charge Tron is really interesting, too. Awesome. What would you play in Legacy? Oh, yeah. I, I'm just going to play four color. I mean, I'm going to try everything in Legacy due to the Constructed Clash coming back. Uh, so I think that my, leg my Legacy range is really about to expand. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think that Four color control actually makes a lot of sense. A uh, sense. Also, the check pile decks are actually some of the decks that are seeing an uptick right now. Like they're actually more popular over the last two weeks, and I think that has a lot to do with kind of the things that we talked about on the show this week. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I mean, show and tell, obviously, but I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am actually curious about playing the. Uh, and trying out the GAC deck that's not the Depths deck, the one that is just like looks like the pre-banned modern GAC deck with Putrid Imps in it. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's on my other computer, but I'll send you the it score for the uh, power rankings if you're interested. But you know, I I do think that that deck is at least interesting. I would be curious to see if just like if just straight GAC is is good enough. Uh, and how that stacks up against the things, but I think that it, it has the potential if the rest of the format is going pretty fair, yep. then I think that that is something that could have play. It had more 5-0s than it did finishes for the power rankings, which I don't know if that means, like, a lot of people tried it, or if that, like, it's it, it's picking up steam. I'm not sure what, what, what which to read into that. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's strange, but I mean, I think that the list look fundamentally solid, you yeah. know, when I see what it is that they're doing. It's the same thing so I think that that's about, right? where, like, the forcible decks just can't be that 8 so. Yeah, and then uh, as far as standard, I, I'm curious about John Dinos right now. I want to see, uh, you know, if Rampaging for Ostodon pushes things over the top, because I think that deck already had a lot of good stuff going on for it anyway. Yeah. I think Gruel, for what it's worth, I, I'm really interested in Gruel Dinos. Do you just want John Dino like... I don't think that the, the the three drop is better than the other three drops that you're already playing in Jun. So like, Gruel makes more sense to me, uh, because like you're not gonna get faster than you already are with, uh, with Jund. So like, well yeah, but it might just be a sideboard card option for like the the matchups where you want it. That's fair. Yeah, I'm thinking of it more in main deck for Gruel. Right, and, and I think in Jun Dinos it's quite possibly a sideboard card. That's fair. I can I can get behind that. Yeah, I don't know if Jun. I don't know if that's what was stopping Jun Dinosaurs from being a deck. That's interesting. I, I do think I, I lean with Spencer where I, I imagine it's much better in the Gruel deck and or a Mono Red because it actually gives you an answer to the Scape Shift decks. So I actually thought about this a lot. While Scape Shift is a really bad matchup for you game one, having it as a sideboard option makes more sense in Mono Red than a main deck option in Mono Red. Sure, that makes sense. But yeah, but either way, the Ferocidon does a lot to check Scape Shift. Like, the escape shift deck has incidental life gain and puts a bunch of creatures in play at a time and normally stabilizes at like nine or eight life or uses a hydro crisis to pull out from when that's happening and frosted on stops all of that in one card. Yeah. So that all being said, I'd register escape shift 
uh they can't all have rock songs <laughs> <laughs> and I, I enjoy playing it and i don't have that many events coming up and i also like frosted on is a hard card to beat a lot of people are going to play it but unless it completely takes over the metagame you're still very good um and it's going to hurt decks like vampires too which can be a tricky matchup in modern uh i have built a lot of amulet titan decks i do not know if any of them are good or even close to playable with the new thing but i do know that if my opponent plays squire and doesn't get feast of phantom feast of famine sword i feel pretty good about what's going on in the game but if I couldn't pick that, I actually had the Soul Herder deck pulled up on Moto here to play when the podcast is done. I'm a little surprised. Uh, like, you've played a lot of Scapeshift. You bought Scapeshift from Oasis Games. Like, mm-hmm. this is the perfect Scapeshift meta. You already know how to play the deck. Why not play it? Honestly, because the tournaments I'm about to play don't really matter too much. Um, and so I'm just kind of interested in exploring what's going on. Um, so, like, so like you have an S- a team SCG tomorrow. What deck are you playing? probably shift probably could be because like i know that deck very well and i can't imagine a lot of people who are just going to an scg are going to bring a lot of extra land hate and stuff that's going to matter like they're not going to bring the the matter and shift and so i don't think like squire plus a four four life linkers can actually stop that deck so i think that deck is very good but i'm very interested in exploring the soul herder decks which admittedly are very bad against uh scape shift in their current iterations so like yeah that's true but like i i do think scape shift is very good um i'm just interested in playing this and i'm interested in playing amulet titan because amulet titan is like a very fast version albeit clunky at times but like i said earlier i'm sometimes willing to sacrifice uh consistency for clunk also uh amulet titan is what we would like to call mason's show and tell (laughs) <laughs> yes that's true i love playing amulet i have a amulet and blade deck because if so, you can put so fortunate in anything you become blade so uh as we're wrapping up this legacy episode give me your legacy pick uh probably four color delver or i would like to try what is this deck called again as i cannot remember its name but it's on the power ranking so i'm a vamp till i get to it uh golgari depths because even though it is hard, it does seem pretty powerful. But I play one of those two decks. Okay. Uh, yep. All right. And you kind of talked about what you thought about our decks. Uh, did you say what you were playing standard? So oh, escape shift. I, I said. Oh, I said. You, with, uh, you, you led with yeah. that. I remember now. It was very short. Um, yeah. I, I just. I honestly don't know enough about standard to give a a, real, a really informed opinion. So. Yeah. I played a lot of standard. Uh, I played mostly escape shift. My highest percentage was escape shift, and then with mono red, so I can completely get up behind that. Uh, Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Uh, We'll see you guys all next week with a brand new episode of Constructed Criticism.